Well, good morning, Redemption Church. My name is Joel Oates, and it is so good to see you here this morning. You know, perhaps you've pulled us up online or, or you're tuning in by radio. Many of you might even be sitting and enjoying the company of family and friends. But we want you to know that regardless of who you are and regardless of where you're tuning in at, we're so thankful that you've joined us this morning. And our prayer right now is that you feel so welcome that even though we're not in a building with four walls right now, you understand that you are loved and you belong. So something that we kind of share every single weekend here at Redemption Church is that we love getting to know people here. And one of the best ways for us to do that is by asking you to fill out one of our connection cards. If you notice in your chat box on the right-hand side, or, or maybe you're currently on our Redemption app or webpage, you're clearly gonna see a link that says connect. Would you do me a favor right now? Would you fill out that form, click that link, fill out that form, and then click submit at the bottom. That's gonna allow us a chance to begin to connect with you, pray with you, care for both you and your family. You know, when you fill out that card, you're gonna discover all the incredible ways that you can begin to serve here or get connected in community and even how you can maybe be a part of what God is doing right here at Redemption Church. Finally, before we jump into our worship service and start hearing from God's word, I, I wanna remind you of something special that we participate in one time a month called communion. Hopefully you saw maybe some of the emails or social media feeds to help you prepare for this time toward the end of the service. So let me encourage you, go ahead and break out your bread or crackers and, and, and juice and, and be ready to share in this special moment following today's message. Again, it is such a joy to have you join us this morning. So let's join our hearts and our voices with our worship team to celebrate the greatness of our God. And again, thank you for being here this morning. Amen. Good morning, Redemption Church. We're so thankful that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. We want to teach you a new song that speaks about the faithfulness of God in every season. As believers in Jesus, we can look back on our lives and remember God's goodness and his faithfulness toward us. And we can sing that he was faithful then and he'll be faithful now. Let's sing this truth together as Danny leads us. You make mountains move. You make giants fall, you use songs of praise to shake prison walls. And I will speak to my fear, I will preach to my doubt. You were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it Yes, I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake prison walls Heaven down to earth, and you will 
Would you just thank the Lord for His faithfulness, His kindness to you. We believe that He's a way maker, that He's a miracle worker. Let's continue to sing about His character and who He is. Let's worship together.
Wow, God is so good. Our lives were truly made for worship in every way. This is the time in our service where we continue to worship our God in the area of our finances. And it's something we like to call the tithe. This is where we get the opportunity to take the first 10% of our income and give it back to God in an act of trust and obedience. You know, worshiping the Lord with our tithes and offerings, it's just one more way that God allows us to show our faithfulness and our trust for Him and tell Him with all that we are that we love Him. He then takes those gifts and He reach, uses them to reach thousands of people who have real needs or maybe have never even heard the good news of Jesus before. You know, stepping into giving, it's never been easier here. There are three easy ways that you can give. You can go online to goredemption.com slash give, or you can text any amount to 84321, or you can give by using the Redemption app that you currently have downloaded on your Apple or your Android device. Let me say thank you to all those that have already chosen to give online. It's truly the safest and easiest way to give. Again, thank you so much for, for being with us here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for what you've given us. We give it back to you and we ask that you would use it for your glory. Jesus, we love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church family. It is a blessing to be in your homes again today. I uh, want to begin by reminding you that this past week, our coast, Gulf Coast region was hit by a ferocious Hurricane Laura Southwest Louisiana faced her devastating power as she hit in one of the fastest, hardest hurricanes to ever hit the state of Louisiana. The devastation is massive, especially around the Lake Charles, Louisiana area. I want you to know as a church family, we sympathize with that kind of hurricane activity. We've had that, experienced it ourselves. So as a, as a way of expressing our love for the people of Louisiana, we have donated $10,000 to the Send Relief Network. That's a part of our Southern Baptist uh, North American Mission Board. And we want to encourage you to know that your giving allows us to be able to send resources at moments of crisis like this. Also, you may be interested in the weeks to come and being a part of a relief team that goes in and helps churches, helps individuals, help people mud out, help people deal with the wind damage, picking up the mess. Uh, your giving uh, through this Send Relief Network provides over 10,000 meals a day for people all over Louisiana, even up into Arkansas. So if you'd like to be a part of a relief effort that will be coming up and being planned right now for the next couple of weeks, uh, just do us this favor. Send an email to this address, relief at goredemption.com, relief at goredemption.com. And let us know of your interest in helping. We'll work out the schedules. We'll let you know what the plans are and pray for the people of Southwest Louisiana in particular. If you have your Bibles, open them to Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 3 through 8 today. The title of the message <laughs> is very appropriate for where we're at. The title of the message is this, don't come back like you left. Don't come back like you left. This week I announced to the church family that we will return to public worship services on September the 13th and we are excited to see each other and to be with one another, to worship our Lord together again. And, and more information is coming out this week about that. But, but when we come back, we need to, as the title suggests, come back different than how we left. You see, Studies around America are showing that during this COVID crisis, people are turning for relief or solace, not to the Word of God, but to Netflix. 89% of Americans in a recent survey to the Pew Research Group said that they were turning when they felt bad, when they were looking for answers, they turned to Netflix. Folks, listen, we can't keep living like this. We, of all people, must be those who turn to the Word of God. We've been studying the book of Romans together. In Romans chapter 1 through 7, Paul lays out the densest, the thickest, the most powerful, truthful theology about salvation that you will ever find. In chapter 8, he celebrates the grace of God in our lives. In chapters 9 through 11, he wrestles with and answers the question about God's plan for the people Israel. 
But in chapter 12, as Taylor so powerfully brought last week, he begins a process of worship. He, he, that actually happens in chapter 11. He just explodes in worship. But worship always leads to something more than emotion. Worship leads us to a covenant, a commitment, a, a way of giving ourselves to God. And that is exactly what we're going to pick up with today. You see, last week Taylor did a masterful job of the first two verses of Romans chapter 12. He says, therefore, in other words, all the theology, all the grace, all the power of what God is doing in this age, he says, therefore, in light of this promise, this truth, this plan, this theology, we must offer ourselves as living sacrifices. He said, this is holy. He said, this is acceptable. He even said, this is logical. This is God's sacrifice. He is worthy of it. And you and I must bring ourselves to give ourselves to the Lord this way. This is none other than radical Christianity. This is radical Christianity. Can I say that in the world we live in that desperately needs radical change in the best way possible, a dead, dying, lifeless, self-centered church will not impact the culture we live in. But a radical form of Christianity, that word radical is used a lot today, but in its Latin form, you know what the word means? It means to return to the root. John chapter 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. In other words, when we come back to this place to worship, we need to come back with a heart that says, God, I have prayed for revival. I've asked you to revive me. I'm believing you're going to revive me. God, do something in my church and in my life. So what is a living sacrifice? Taylor did an outstanding job of describing that last week. But we have an example in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 2, he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. It's a powerful picture from the Old Testament. It's a picture of Abraham who had prayed for, longed for, hoped for, wished for a son. And finally, when he's beyond any possibility of having a son, he and his wife are blessed by God with Isaac. They laughed when God said, a year from now, you'll have a baby. That's what the name Isaac means, laughter. So it's a picture of now God saying to him, we've gone all this distance together. You've seen me move, and I've seen you believe, and I, I, you're, you're like a friend to me, but now I want you to do something. I want you to offer that son that you prayed for, that one that you love the most on an altar to me as a burnt sacrifice. But what a powerful picture because it was never God's intent to destroy Isaac's life. It was only God's intent to test the heart of Abraham. And he looked up. Isaac asked his dad, Dad, who, who will be the sacrifice? He said, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. And sure enough, at the moment he was about to thrust the knife into Isaac's chest, the Lord, the angel of the Lord stopped him. When Abraham looked up, he saw a ram, a lamb caught in the thicket. What a picture of Christ on the cross wearing a crown of thorns for us. He is the substitution. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. An amazing picture of the gospel. But here's a question. What held Isaac on the altar as a living sacrifice? You see, that story is a picture of a sacrifice that was made but continued to live. And then Paul says in Romans 12, we are to be such a sacrifice, a living sacrifice to the Lord. Can I tell you the problem with living sacrifices? One old preacher said, they have a hard time staying on the altar. They're always slipping off. They're always running away. But what a picture of Isaac. He doesn't run from his father. He was a lot younger. He could have, he could have laughed and said, dad, you're crazy, man. I'm out of here. But he didn't. He cooperated. He laid upon the altar. What held Isaac on the altar? Can I just simply say this? He knew two things about his father that I believe held him to that altar. One, he knew his father was a wise man. Two, he knew his father was good. You see, Abraham, his father, was trusting his heavenly father, who he knew was wise and he knew was good. And Isaac was trusting his father the same way. There's something about my heart that doesn't want to stay on the altar of God. Even when I'm moved by God, even when I say, Lord, I give you my all, there's something inside of me that wants to run. There's something inside of me that wants to slip off. There's something inside of me that finds it hard to stay on the altar. Are you that way? I am. 
You see, we like to keep our options open, don't we? We like to be unhindered. We like to be free. But you're not free. You're, you're not free because you've become a slave to your career, a slave to your love pursuit, a slave to your fame or to your body or to your health or to your family. The real freedom comes when you bind yourself to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Lord, here's my life. I want it to glorify you. I want to do what you made me to do and how you made me to do it. So, Paul's thinking that our reasonable act of worship is that we would offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. So, he knows too how hard it is. Go back and read Romans chapter 7. He knows how hard it is to stay on that altar, to remain sacrificed to the Lord, a living sacrifice. By the way, a in a living sacrifice, something has to die. It's not you that dies, it's your dream or your pursuit or your desires or your flesh or your selfishness or having yourself and, and the world you live in tells you it's okay to love yourself the way that you can give yourself anything. Be kind to yourself and good to yourself. That's the message of the world. But the message of scripture is the way we get to the heart of God as true worshipers is that we lay our lives down for Christ, for me to live as Christ. And to die is gain, Paul said. See, real freedom comes when we bind ourselves to the Lord. We don't like to do that. We don't like to make commitments. We don't like to do that because it restricts our quote-unquote freedom. So how do you stay on the altar? Paul's about to tell us. In verses, in verses 3 through 8 of chapter 12, Paul's in the same frame of mind. He shows us how the gospel impacts our lives. And this is how we live a life for the glory of God. This is how we remain his living sacrifice. He points out three very important things that keep us on the altar, that keep us near the heart of God, that keep us in a right position so that God can use our lives for his glory. And as we come back to the church, this is what I'm asking you to do. Do not come back the way you left. You say, well, Brother Ed, I was doing pretty good, spiritually good. But I'm telling you, good's not enough. God wants more in your life. God wants more of you, not just a little bit of you. He wants all of you. He deserves all of you. Do not come back the way you left. Begin praying now. Take the walk now. Begin searching God. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Search the scripture. Ask God to show you what it is in your life that God wants to do and what he wants to do through you. Friend, there is nothing as powerful as knowing that God is using your life, that he made you, he redeemed you, and he wants to use you to bring others to him, to help others grow in him. So what are the three things Paul points out? Look at verse 3, the beginning of our text, and here it is. The first thing we must do to stay on that altar as a living sacrifice is be humble, which requires us to change how we think about ourselves. Be humble. Write that down. We need to change how we think about ourselves. Look at verse 3. Paul then says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourselves more highly as you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now notice that. He uses the word think three times. So how should a living sacrifice think about him or herself? He says with sober judgment. You see, it is easy to get intoxicated on yourself. Now, some of you laugh or you think that's not true. It is true. And let me, I want to show you this. It's either the sweet wine of self-glorification or the bitter beer of self-condemnation. It doesn't really matter. You see, the person who constantly talks about themselves in glowing terms and the person who constantly talks about themselves in ugly terms are doing the same thing. They're both pointing attention to themselves. A living sacrifice must first be humble. If we're going to be useful for God, we must humble ourselves before him. So why does Paul first address the subject of pride? Because our natural tendency is to think more of ourselves than we should or less of ourselves than we should. And the gospel helps us to think rationally about ourselves. How does it do that? Well, there's two ways. First of all, the gospel reminds us of how helpless we are. 
God, the, God has saved us entirely as an act of his mercy, his grace, and by his love and power. If you had what it took to save yourself, Jesus would not have had to die on the cross. And the gospel destroys the false doctrine of self-sufficiency, which many of us are eaten up with. The doctrine of self-sufficiency, I pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I take care of myself. I pay my own way. I'm the center of my universe. That's called pride. And by the way, let me remind you, pride is what made the devil the devil. If you live your ambitions for self-glory, you're going to have to decide at some point to lay them on the altar. You're going to have to surrender all and say, Jesus, it's not about me, it's all about you. It reminds us of how sinful, how broken, how inept, and how helpless we are. We need a Savior. But at the same time, it does something more glorious. The gospel reminds us of how valuable we are. He says, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, I can say to everyone who's a member of Redemption Church, God loves you, God created you, Jesus redeemed you, and God has a purpose for your life. He has something he wants you to do. And when we come back together, let's just don't come back and say, shoo, I'm glad all that's over with. No, it's not gonna be over with, but listen to me. That's not how we should approach it. We should come back together in an explosion of love for God and a passion for Christ, a desire for his word, and a hunger for God to use our lives again. Think with sober judgment, the Bible says, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. What does it mean when Paul says here, each of us having a measure of faith? Well, let me tell you the false view first. And, and honestly, I labored under this for a long time. The false view says every believer has a certain amount of faith. Some have more, some have less. That's not true. That's not at all what he says here. The word measure is an interesting Greek word. It's the word we get the word meter from, meter or the metric system. It's a standard of measure. What he's saying is, let's read it again, thinks with sober judgment, each according to the metric system of faith that God has assigned. What is the measurement of faith that God has assigned? It's Jesus. It starts with Jesus, it ends with Jesus, it's all about Jesus. Jesus is our standard by which a believer measures everything in his or her life. The finished work of Jesus is every believer's standard of faith. In other words, what he did for you and me on the cross proves what a sinner I am and how deeply valuable I am simultaneously. You see, this makes us profoundly, listen to this, profoundly equal in the body of Christ. There are no superior people in the church. So if you've been going to church looking down your nose at other people, friend, you need to repent because no one got here on their own. All are recipients of incredible grace and mercy. All came through the blood of Jesus Christ. All came through the cross. We are saved by the same grace. We are saved to be a part of the same body of believers. We are empowered by the same spirit. We, we have our hearts and minds fixed on the same mission together to make disciples who make disciples. No one has room to look down at another person. Friend, every one of us is a saint, saved, wretched sinner, but dearly loved by God. We're in an interesting cultural moment in America. Christians are often viewed in our culture as arrogant people. And there's several reasons for that. One is some are very arrogant. And even this week, we've watched in the news the horror story of some very arrogant leaders who are clearly Christian leaders being brought down. It breaks our heart for the shame that it brings upon all. But there's another reason. It's because we proclaim a gospel of assurance. We proclaim that you can know for certain that you have everlasting life. And this leads a lost world to look at us as arrogant, because you know what they hear us say when we say this? By the way, it is not wrong to say that you can have assurance of your salvation or that I know for certain that when I die, I go to heaven, but I better explain it to somebody because otherwise, here's what they're gonna hear. I'm better than you. I'm better than you, that's why I'm going to heaven. That's how they think of that. You see, <clears throat> a generation, there's also among us a generation that is trained they have trained that there is no such thing as absolute truth, and anyone who makes an absolute truth claim 
is simply trying to oppress them or dominate people. This is how totalitarian regimes have worked throughout the years. Whoever their leader is, he becomes godlike and becomes the center of truth, and no one can disagree with him. We have watched this throughout history, and now in our universities and colleges and high schools and middle schools, it is taught that there is no such thing as truth. But in fact, the Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But friend, he's not a totalitarian who's trying to destroy your life and oppress your life and abuse your life. He is one who came to give his life, to be oppressed, to be abused for you. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. Friend, listen to me. You say, well, pastor, if they believe this, what good is it to witness? We've got to witness. We've got to speak up. We've got to tell our children, grandchildren. We've got to tell the generations to come that who he is and what he has done for us. In Luke chapter 18, two men went to the temple to worship, to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. Now, every morning at the temple, they would have a service where they would sing. Maybe somebody would bring a message or read from a psalm. Then they would offer a lamb as a sacrifice for the sins of the people. The priest would then take the incense from the altar and he would slip through the curtains into the temple area to an area where Zechariah, uh, the father of John the Baptist, was doing. This is what he was doing. And he would put incense on the altar for the sins of the people who were out there. This was the morning worship ritual at the temple. This is also when the people, when that priest would step into that, that inner area of the temple, the people begin praying. The Pharisee prayed, thank you, God, I'm not like that guy over there. Are those people over there? Thank you, God, I don't need to be here. Thank you, God, I'm just here to show up and tell you what a good guy I am. I don't cuss, I don't chew, I don't smoke, girl, <laughs> smoke girls or date girls who do. I don't, I don't do all these things that he's out bragging about, and I tithe everything. He has absolutely no need for grace. But the other guy, said, the scripture says, would beat his chest. By the way, in the Eastern culture, only women did that in extreme grief. Why is he doing that? He, has, he, he will not even look up, the scripture says. He cries out, oh God, have mercy upon me. And, and he confesses his sins. What he's really praying is this. God, when that incense is put on the altar, would you let it cover my sin? And Jesus said, one of those men, and you can guess which one, went home justified that day. It wasn't, but hear this, it wasn't the beating of his chest that saved him. It wasn't his tears or his cry. It was the atonement of the Paschal Lamb, the, the Passover Lamb, the Son of God who gave himself for him. Crying out to God in this moment is the most humble thing you could do. But I'm telling you, friend, you will realize the power of God's love when you cry out to him as a sinner. He will save you. And if you are a religious person, please do not come back into this building strutting like a peacock, acting like you've got your act together and that you know better than anybody else and that you're here doing God a favor. Friend, you come back into this church building. You come broken and grateful that God has forgiven you as a sinner. And you will find the presence of God in this place. You will find God's grace and you will find God's mercy. Number one, Paul says, if we're going to stay on this altar as living sacrifices, we better humble ourselves. Number two, he says, first, be humble. Secondly, he says, be the church. Be humble and be the church, which means we're going to have to change how we think about church. So how do you think about church? I'm not asking you what do you think about church? I'm asking you, how do you think about church? Or what you think about church? I'm asking you, how do you think about church? Is church essential or is it non-essential? Hey, here's a good question. Do you see yourself as the church? Or when you pass by this building, do you see there, hey, there's my church and we can't go over there and worship right now. We, we can't meet there right now. When you drive by this building, is this the church? The Bible says we must see that we are the church. The church, for many, the church is like a middle school PE program. I, I remember, I don't know if you remember, I remember distinctly my first week at middle school 
And I remember I had to dress out and go to PE. First of all, I didn't want to undress in front of other human beings at 12 years old. And I certainly didn't want to go out and exercise. But I, and I, by the way, I discovered something. You can't get out of it. It is a requirement. And it's a requirement in the body of Christ that God's plan is that if we're going to be a living sacrifice, we've got to dress out and we've got to participate. We cannot come and just be bystanders. We cannot come and find our little nick ditch, our little corner, our little chair, our little place, and we just sit and watch and listen, get up and leave. If we're going to be the church, we've got to be the church. And what's interesting is the language Paul uses in verse 4. First of all, he says church is unity. Verse 4, for as in one body we, hold, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. You see, <clears throat> listen, it's fun to go to a place where everybody thinks like you, votes like you, and looks like you, but God's church isn't that. We show very little of the unity of the glory of God and the unity of God's purpose in this world when we only hang around those who are like us. God's church is full of all kinds of people, rich and poor, black and white. He's full of all kinds of people, high education, low education, menial laborers, people who own businesses. We all come together and the ground is level at the cross. And Paul loves to use body analogy when he talks about the church. God created the parts of your body to function together. That's what the church is. He says we're living stones in 1 Corinthians built together. If you saw a severed hand in the parking lot at the grocery store, that would freak you out. It would freak me out. But you would know something very dramatic was wrong. But how is it that so many churches can have severed parts, parts that don't function, parts that go in different directions, parts that are divided, parts that are not unified on the purpose of the mission of the church? You see, the view that we are a unified group of people in one body moving in one direction as the head commands, and I'm not the head, Jesus is the head. This view has transformed the church because it keeps us tied to God's deepest purpose, which is his gospel. It requires humility because every part has to bow to the ultimate direction and purpose of the head. If Jesus, if church for you is only coming occasionally, hearing a sermon, singing, leaving committed to cuss less and go more. No wonder you're bored to tears. No wonder some of you are thinking about never coming back. Because you have not discovered the joy of being used by God in other people's lives. I watch it happen in this church all the time. I see people with gifts of mercy pouring out mercy on people who desperately are starving for mercy. I watch people with gifts of encouragement build people up who are as low as they've ever been. I watch people with gifts of teaching to help people understand the complexities of life or scripture or both. Do you see the need for a unified church? When a church gathers, each part should sacrificially bring something of themselves to offer not just to the Lord but to one another. I watched over the years as Satan has peeled people off from this congregation because he loves to isolate people in their sin, isolate people in their despair, isolate people in their hurt so that he can ultimately, like the things we watch on National Geographic, take you out. And some people today have been taken out and it breaks the heart of God and it breaks the heart of your pastor. Church is unity, but church is also diversity. Look at verse 5. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. The great seal of the United States of America had these Latin words emblazed upon them, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. That is exactly the seal of the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus seeks to save the lost and he loves the color he created them to have. He loves the personality he gave them. He loves their cultural distinctives, but he wants all of them to come to Christ. And this COVID crisis, did you want another? Did you want another, the others in this church? Did you look out for one another? Did you get closer to one another? Did you pray for one another? Did you encourage one another? Did you exhort one another? Or did you watch Netflix? I, I watch Netflix. It's not a sin to watch Netflix necessarily. But did you forget about one another? P. 
People say, I don't need a church to be a Christian. That proves you do not understand how a body works. If you can cut off your head or if you can cut off your arm and still function as you think normally, friends, you do not understand what God is saying to us. We are the presence and the power of the living God in this community. That's why the church must thrive. That's why it must have people who understand that we are unified and diversified and we are responsible for one another and that we love one another. And it is pride that keeps us from this. There was a a man who had been promoted to a major in the United States Army. He got a new office, a new desk. It was in a new building. He was sitting there when he saw a private walk in from the outside window, walk into the outer office. He picked up the phone. He wanted to impress the young private. And so as the private walked up to knock on his door, he could see him because the door was open. When he walked up, he, he said, yes, Mr. President. He said, things are going well, Mr. President. Yes, sir, first day on the job. It's wonderful. Yes, sir, I will do exactly what you asked me to do. And yes, sir, thank you. Well, you're welcome. Anytime I can advise you, anytime I can help you, that's what I'm here for. He hangs up the phone. He says, private, what are you looking for? He said, uh, sir, I'm here to hook up the telephone. I know nobody's laughing here, but you see, it is pride when we go to church and our hearts are full of pride about ourselves, our achievements, and we don't listen to and care for one another. You see, the church is also our responsibility. Verse 5, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Every, listen to this. Everybody needs a purpose in life and everybody needs a place in this world. Let me say that again. Everyone needs a purpose in life and everyone needs a place in this world. And guess what? God's answer to that need is the church. A purpose and a place. We're responsible to do our part. We're responsible to be faithful. We're responsible to come. We're responsible to sacrifice. We're responsible to give ourselves to God. How could you use me to spread the gospel through my church? Paul says if we're going to stay on that altar as living sacrifices, we better be humble. Number two, we better be the church. We're going to have to change how we think about ourselves. We're going to have to change how we see the church. But here's the third one. Be a servant, which requires us to change how we think about our role. Look at verse 6. Paul says that you have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to your faith, if service in serving, if one who teaches in teaching, if one who exhorts in exhortation, if the one who contributes with generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now, there are several lists of spiritual gifts in the Bible. This one is interesting because this one outlines what the church day in and day out should be. He talks about the gift of prophecy. That isn't speaking things that aren't happening and no one sees but you see. It's speaking forth the word of God, which is what I'm doing right now. Uh, He says, do it with faith. Believe what God has said. If service, serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's exhorting, that's encouraging from the word of God for people to live our lives in a way that pleases God. That's also what I'm doing right now. If it's contributing, do it with generosity. If you lead, do it with zeal. If it's an act of mercy. And I just want to tell you, there's some people with a gift of mercy in this church that thrill my heart. They do some of the hardest things I've ever seen. Many of them are medical professionals. Some of them are not. But they just love helping people. You know, in the Chronicles of Narnia, it always kind of threw me off when I read about Father Christmas showing up. I thought, hey, that's Santa Claus. What's he doing here in this story? That's kind of weird. C.S. Lewis kind of cheats here and puts in Santa Claus or to make, make the whole story more joyful, but that's not what's happening. He makes a profound point. When Father Christmas shows up, he gives the children, by the way, they just entered into Narnia, which is C.S. Lewis's way of saying they just became Christians. They were born again. And the first thing that happens is they meet Father Christmas and he gives them gifts that have purpose for how they would serve him in Narnia. So when God saved you, my friend, guess what he did? He gave you gifts. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about here, which implies and strongly suggests that if God has gifted you, he has a purpose for the gift that he gave you. What is your gift? He says, according to the grace given us. He gives us, this grace means an extra power to do things. By the way, everything listed in that list I just read, Uh, in in verses six, seven, and eight, we're all to do. We're to exhort one another, encourage one another, serve one another, have mercy on one another. But some are given an extra power of grace to do this 
with power and strength, and it's fulfilling. And it meets the needs of the body of Christ and helps the body of Christ remain strong and healthy. You see, I know that my calling in, in giftedness is in the area of exhortation and in leadership. Friend, I can't do everything. I can't be in all places. That's why God made us a body. I'm not the only exhorter. I'm not the only leader. I'm not the only servant in this church. So what is your gift? While you don't have to do everything like me, you can't. You got to do something. You got to do something. So pastor, how do I discover what my gift is? Well, let me tell you that one way that I thought you could do it for many years, and I've tried but it didn't work so well, as I would take a gift survey, a spiritual gift survey. Uh, the first one I took said I had the gift of singleness. <laughs> I said, no way. No, I'm not into that. The second one I took said I had the gift of martyrdom. I said, you know what? I'm not going to do any more of these gifts. Test. L- let, me give you, let me give you what I'm calling the, basically the Venn diagram. The Venn diagram has three areas. Here, here's the first one. Look at the word affinity. Affinity on the top. Draw these circles someplace. And and I want you to to, to notice, first of all, you need to ask the question, what am I passionate about? What What are the needs that I see that I'm drawn to solving? Uh, What kind of ministry feels satisfying to me? And, And maybe you would use some of your past experience to see this. Did God allow you to go through a painful experience in life? Then maybe God has a ministry for you and a gifting for you in the area of that. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse four said, blessed be to God who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves were comforted of God. In other words, God wants you to be like him and bring comfort the way he brought comfort to you. So what is your affinity? Secondly, what is your ability? Your ability is something you're good at, something you were trained to do or not trained to do. It's just something you enjoy doing or you're good at doing. The third thing is affirmation. This is so important because the body of Christ affirms you as you practice this gift. And and so let me just say this. You may not need to take a gift inventory. You may need to just to start working in the church, start serving in the children's area, start serving in the student area, the worship ministry, in the parking lot, and the greeting team. And by the way, if you, see, if you think your gift is finding problems and you've discovered, and by the way, it will not take you long to find problems at Redemption Church. But when you do, don't come running to me and say, I found a problem. Here, understand that if you see it, God likely is calling you to solve it. So the best way to discover your spiritual gift is begin serving. Use this Venn diagram. Pray. Ask God to show you what your spiritual gift is. Study the word yourself. Read on this subject. Because all of it leads to a very important place. When we come back together, we need to ask this question, what kind of church does God want redemption to be? Let me ask that again. What kind of church does God want redemption to be? I'm going to suggest two thoughts. I believe God wants us to be a church where no one is a spectator. And a church where everyone is has a gospel ministry. Some way you're reaching people. Some way you're making disciples. Some way you're helping people find Christ. Now don't get the cart before the horse. Before God will reveal his gift to you, before God will reveal the mysteries of scripture to you, he's gonna start by saving you. Have you been saved? Have you trusted Christ as your savior? Have you better received his gift of eternal life? You see, the gospel is this. Jesus came to earth to die on the cross, to give you and, my, you and me forgiveness of our sins and to give us a new life. Have you received him by faith? It will require that you humble yourself and say, Jesus, save me. Remember that man in Acts chapter 18 or Luke chapter 18 rather? God, I'm a despicable sinner. I'm not a good moral person like that guy across the street. And I hope that your sacrifice will cover my sin. Friend, you don't have to hope anymore. The moment you ask him, Christ will make his sacrifice cover your sin. And then I say to you, welcome to the body of Christ. Come join us. Come back. But not the way you left.
I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And they did eat. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. With gratitude, give thanks and drink this cup. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, scripture says, we proclaim the Lord's death, burial and resurrection until he comes again. Blessing upon you, your home. Blessing upon this church until God brings us together again. May we return to this place different, changed, transformed by the grace of God through the blood and the body of Jesus Christ so that when we gather, we will know this is a new day and God is moving in a new way for his glory. I'm so thankful 
for, for a God that loves us so much and he invites us into his work. You know, maybe God grabbed hold of your heart this morning in some way. And we would love to celebrate that decision with you and walk alongside you in your newfound faith in Christ. Would you do me a favor? Would you take out your phone right now and text us the word new life, all one word, to 63566. This is gonna allow us a chance to begin to follow up with you, begin praying with you, and supporting you in this new life-changing decision you just made. You know, maybe you just need prayer or you want someone to pray with you. One of the easiest ways for us to do that is by going to the link that you see below currently popping up. It's goredemption.com slash prayer. You can be assured that someone's gonna begin praying for you. Bring in your requests daily before the Lord. Finally, for all those who joined us this morning, thank you. What a joy to have you tune in and worship together with us. Jesus is alive and well and in control of all things. And it's a promise that we can count on no matter the circumstances you're currently walking through. So may your hope always be found in him. You know, we don't dismiss here at Redemption Church, we always send. So you're a sent people this morning. Be a light to all the world, and we'll see you this week.